Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and I am very excited to bring to you another special edition. And this one is going to be on what is the Sabbath and what happened to it. You know, the Bible is filled with the word Sabbath. It is everywhere. And I want to ask everyone to look into this for yourself and ask yourself, why doesn't people teach this anymore? I want to also encourage everyone to keep an open mind. A lot of what you are going to hear will be challenging, but if you just stick with me, it's going to be very beneficial all the way until the end. We have a lot of quotes. We have a lot of Bible scriptures. We got his, his, historical figures that we're going to quote from, and uh, it's going to be really exciting. This is a lot of information all coming together, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, the word Sabbath is a Hebrew word. Um in Hebrew, it's actually Shabbat. The English rendition is Sabbath, and we are going to dig into this, so why don't we get started? So let's look at our agenda and our investigating uh, little guy right there with his magnifying glass. That's what we're going to do. We're going to investigate this matter. So we are going to de define the Sabbath. We're going to look at some New Testament quotes. We're going to look at Paul and Sabbath keeping. We're going to look at the early church fathers. We're also going to look at Constantine. We're going to look at the Roman Catholic Church Council meetings. This is how they came to craft their institution of Christianity in the Catholic Church. We're going to look at Catholic Church quotes. We're going to look at the calendar. Some people want to talk about you know, the calendar is off. We're going to address that. The mainstream Christianity talking points, we are going to address those. There's a lot of just quick religious sounding comments that people throw out there to uh, just knock down anybody who mentions the Sabbath. And we're going to look at those and investigate them and say, hey, is there any validity to those? And again, I want to encourage everyone to keep an open mind. You know, the Bible says that we need to test and prove all things, and we should legitimately give this uh, opportunity to investigate and to see if it is true. You know, you can't just shoot things down and never look at them. You know, that's not the way to be. If you are really a lover of truth, you will investigate and, and seek it out and weigh it and look at both sides of the issue. That is what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be lovers of the truth. All right. Truth. What is truth? What is truth? Here's a great definition. This is how I, I, I found it in a, an old Webster dictionary, but you can see other renditions of it. Modern dictionaries, they're trying to do away with truth. So don't bother yourself with those. But this is what it says. Truth is that which is in accordance with what is, was, and yet to be. What is true today was true yesterday and will be true tomorrow. That is what truth is. It is a standard, standard of something that is real and has happened and will not change. Truth, the pesky thing about the truth is it doesn't go away. That's a great quote from one of my friends, uh, you know. People can, you know, throw out propaganda all they want, but the truth, it's going to stick around. People are going to see it, and they, they, they go to it. So I uh, also want to point out that if you do any, any research on God's name in Hebrew, it also has the same meaning. Uh, it's a compound of three words in Hebrew, and his name means he who was, he who is, and he who is yet to be. Because we know that God is all truth. And with that being said, you can also check out my uh, teaching on Project Truth Beam uh, on the name of God. It's really great. I really encourage it. I show you all the evidence of how you can uh, read it and what it means and where is all the evidence of it. And it's really exciting. With that being said, God's word is true therefore it is true forever i think we can agree upon that if his his bible is true yesterday it'll also be true tomorrow and uh 
So let's look at the Sabbath. So Sabbath, the word Shabbat in Hebrew, it means to rest or cease from your labor. That is what it translates to, a resting or a ceasing from work. You know, you got something to do that you normally do. That's what you're supposed to stop. You're supposed to cease from it. Now, I got Sabbaths plural here, um, but we know we need to know that there's actually more than one Sabbath. So there is a weekly Sabbath that is at the end of the the end of the week, and there's also other Sabbaths. They're called rest or cease days, exactly. And those can fall during the feast. So God has these feasts. God knew that man was a party animal. And uh, he wanted people to come together and, and celebrate. And so God designed the feast. They are God's feasts. They're not man's feasts. That's what the Bible says. It's his feast. And we just get to partake in them. But there can also be Sabbaths during those feasts. You know, the start of the feast and the end of the feast, the last day and the first day, tend to be a Sabbath day. And you can also have a, a weekly Sabbath fall in the middle of that. You can also have a seven-year Sabbath, which is seven-year rest of the land. I'm sure a lot of farmers know about, you know, resting the land. And we've lost that cycle. And there's also the, the uh, 50th year anniversary uh, Sabbath. Uh, letting the land rest. So when we don't have a count of that either, so there's no way to actually do that. And, and by the way, that also says to let the land of Israel rest. That doesn't mean uh, the rest of the world was commanded to do that, although I think it's a good idea to let your land rest so that it can replenish its nutrition new, and new soils and mineral content, et cetera, et cetera. But for the purpose of this teaching, we're going to be talking and focusing on the weekly Sabbath. And we'll jump in a little bit with uh, the uh, feast Sabbath, but really we're going to focus on this, the weekly Sabbath, which is the seven days of the week uh, and ending of the seven days. The seven day cycle exists around the world and it is on every continent and it dates all the way back to the beginning of mankind. There have been people trying to get us off a seven-day cycle. It's happened uh, quite a few times. The Romans tried it two or three times, and they could not get it to stick. Uh, around the world, there's um, they, ex they experienced trying in France to, to do uh, a 15-day cycle, or I think it was a 10 cycle. But anyways, they always crashed and burned. People just get overworked. It just doesn't work. So this seven day of the week cycle existed all the way back to Adam and Eve, and it has always been there, and you can find it everywhere. And it hasn't gotten off, and we'll talk more about that as well. Now, a lot of people out there, they want to conflate worship with the Sabbath. And we're going to tackle that, but I want to just point out to you Sabbath means rest or ceasing from your labor. That does not put any requirement on worship. You can worship because now you have all this free time to rest and, and talk to God and pray to God. But you have nowhere in the Bible where it is requiring worship. And in the ancient days, they would worship all the time. It could be every day of the week. You know, you could go sacrifice your animals. Every day of the week, if you're, you know, if you can afford it, or if you are uh, messing up all the time, you that was your form of worship was to go to the temple, pray to God, and also sacrifice animal. So worship is not stuck on the Sabbath. It's not, it, it's not locked in. And that's what you find when you talk to mainstream people in religious circles, is they want to stick worship also with the day that's holy um, being like the sabbath so when you talk to christians they'll say well sunday is my sabbath you know some of them might say that well okay the sabbath is a day of rest 
um, you can you can worship any day. Why, why are you saying it's Sunday? Sunday is not spelled out to be that day. So that's what I'm trying to break from people's minds in this teaching of what the Sabbath truly is. And there is uh, actually, it's quite clear in the Bible what the Sabbath is, and there's not a lot of requirements. The Bible uh, spells it out pretty simple, and it leaves it up to you. And so what I want to, you know, one of the things I'll point out is the rabbinical rabbis, the Pharisees, they all talk about the Sabbath is a mountain holding on by a thread. And what they mean is the mountain is all of their oral Torah, all their added commandments that you can't do this, you can't do that. And uh, that is actually man-made doctrine, which Jesus spoke against. He said, don't follow these doctrines of man. It's man-made. It's added in. You, you've added to the Bible. You shouldn't have added to the Bible. And so it's the thread of, that's holding that mountain is actually what the scriptures say. The thread is very small. So there's not a whole lot telling you what you're supposed to do. Rest and cease from your labor. It's very simple. You know, God made it very simple so that everyone could do it. And um, also, uh, there is uh, the whole point that people will say that people are trying to earn their earn their salvation, and it's and it's not about salvation; it's about obedience. You get your salvation through Jesus and what He's done for us. We got grace, and obedience is what you do after that. So. God has saved you. Now, what do you do? You're supposed to be obedient. Do what he says to do. And, and that's what we're going to get into is what is the Sabbath day? Where did it come from? All that. Where did it go? And I, I just briefly talked about the oral Torah. We're going to get into that. The oral Torah is man-made doctrines and added regulations that have been put upon people's heads and made it difficult. I'll give you a brief little story about some of these. Oral Torah stuff is on the Sabbath, the, the rabbinical Jews and the Orthodox, they, they say you can't even tear a piece of paper, uh, a toilet paper. You can't even tear toilet paper on the Sabbath. So you have to pre-tear your toilet paper because that might be considered work. And um, there are regulations that have, they have come up with. Of course, it's not in the Bible. It's, it's just abs absurd. But one of the regulations is, it's okay to uh, carry your furniture in your own house. So you can carry your couch up and down the stairs a hundred times, but you can't turn on the light switch. You know, that's not what the Bible says. And if you carry your couch up and down your, your stairs in your house a hundred times, that's pretty uh, work-like. You know, I'm going to work up a sweat. And that's, uh, that doesn't feel like resting. And so the oral Torah is, is something that Jesus spoke against. And you also see many examples of Jesus being confronted with Pharisees trying to impose oral Torah on him. You know, they, they come to him and say, you're healing on the Sabbath. You're, you are, um, and there's, no, there's nowhere in the Bible that says you can't heal someone on the Sabbath. It's not considered work. It's oral in the oral Torah. They they call it work, but in the real in the Bible, in the scriptures, it's not work. It's not considered work. That's God. That's uh, activities for God. You know, healing somebody, and uh, you can see him breaking the oral Torah. For example, he is at a wedding, an Orthodox wedding, and the the hand washing pots that the the stone hand washing vessels that is oral Torah that you wash your hands with this special water and special pots. And it's oral Torah that you do not put wine in those hand washing pots. And of course, Jesus turns it into wine right there in front of him, right in front of everyone. And so he is breaking oral Torah in their face. Another example of Jesus violating their oral, oral Torah is that um, he made 
uh, mud. It says he took clay and he spit in it and he rubbed it together and he put it on someone's eyes and he healed the blind man with it. Well, it's a violation of oral Torah to mix clay and spit. And the reason being, they, they said on the Sabbath, you can't even spit on the ground because that might be an act of making pottery and making pottery is work on the Sabbath. And, you know, this is just absurd. This is man-made doctrines. Nowhere in the Bible says you can't make pottery on the Sabbath. That's just crazy. And you can't heal on the Sabbath. So the, this religious elite at the time was trying to impose their man-made doctrines and their customized religion, which was a violation of thou shalt not add to or take away. That's what the Bible says. But these people were doing that. And so, so you see Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, he is... He is showing them your man-made doctrines are nothing. In fact, I'm going to violate them in your face on the Sabbath. And so we're, we're going to get to more of that, of what was happening on, these, on the Sabbath and what it, what it actually looks like. So this actually happened last Sabbath. I hope you enjoy this. This is resting on the Sabbath. Doesn't that look, doesn't that look great? You know, I got my beverage there. I'm floating. I'm, I'm not getting exhausted. I'm not working my job. You know, I'm not causing anyone to work, right? I'm just chilling. Doesn't that look good? Who, who wants to, uh, who wants to uh, fight against this? Are you fighting against this? You want to rest? I've actually had people say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to rest. Like, really? God's telling you to rest on the seventh day? And you're not wanting to do that. You don't want to take off. You know, one of my favorite things to do on, on the Sabbath is take a nap. <laughs> Man, that's great. A good nap on the Sabbath. So great. You know, these people, they, they just, well, I just want to work all the time. You know, you know or, or they'll say, well, I worship God every day. Okay, that's fine, but are you resting on the seventh day? Because that's what he says to do. You can worship every day. It's, I'm not telling you to worship on any, any particular day. You know, the question is, are you actually Sabbath? Are you doing Sabbath every day? Because if you're doing that, then you're lazy because you're just resting all day, every day. Every day of the week can't be Sabbath. You know, that's why you have to really separate out what is a day of worship with what is Sabbath. They're not, they don't have to be the same. You can worship on the Sabbath, but you can't Sabbath every day. That's not what the Bible says. It says you're to work six days and rest on the Sabbath. And we're actually going to get into that. We're going to look at those verses. So the seventh day is, and I'm going to prove to you that in English, we say Saturday. And that comes from Saturn, the worship of Saturn. And, and I have a whole teaching on the days of the week. Uh, you should check that out and how we got the names of the days of the week and what pagan gods there are. Just a little quick teaser. Sunday is the day of the sun. That's when the pagans will worship sun god. Monday is moon god day and uh, Saturday is for Saturn. And I have a whole video on that. It's, it's really great for Project Truth Beam. You need to check that out. But this right here is how we're showing what day of the week was was uh, the Sabbath? And here you just jump into other languages around the world. In Hebrew, Shabbat, of course, Aramea, uh, Arabic, it's uh, Sebet. I'm not going to read all of these. And Bosnian is Subu, Subuta. And Croatian is Subuta. And Greek is Sab, uh, Sabato. And Italian is Sabato. In Latin is Sabatum. In Russian, it's Subuta. In uh, Somalian, it's Sabit, uh, Sabit T. Sorry, Sabit T. And in Sudanese, it's Sabatu. So that's that's right there. You can just and in you know Spanish, you can jump into all these languages and you see the word for Saturday, the seventh day of the week, is Sabbath. In different and many different languages around the world and there's a reason for that 
It's because God locked it in from Adam and Eve, and it has always existed. So when did the Sabbath start? Genesis 2, verse 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. This is God doing his creation. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. So the seventh day is the Sabbath day. It's the day of rest. Because God rested and he ceased from his work. It was done. He finally created the, everything that you see. The earth and everything. And the animals. And Adam and Eve. And then he rested. He's, he's Sabbath. You know. And, and if you are keeping the Sabbath. Or celebrating the Sabbath every week. You are also recreating that same that same activity of working every day of the week and then resting, just like God. You're basically mimicking the same actions of God by working really hard at everything that you do, and then you're resting. So God did it. It all goes back to God, and you are mimicking creation every single week. How beautiful is that? Now, the days of the week in Hebrew is not given a name in modern hebrew they're given the name of the days of the week but in ancient in ancient biblical times it was one through six so the first day the second day some the third day the fourth day the fifth day the sixth day and the last one was called shabbat sabbath rest cease from work let's look at it is to be a sign that is the Sabbath, Exodus 31, 12 through 18. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak also to the children of Israel. Let's stop right there. The children of Israel. Is that just the tribe of Judah and the Jews? No, the children of Israel are the 12 tribes. But in this case, it's not just the, the 12 tribes because this is out Mount Sinai. It is also the mixed multitudes that have gathered themselves into the 12 tribes, into the children of Israel, which is what God's using as the term. So speak also, this is Moses, God speaking to Moses, speak also to the children of Israel saying, surely my Sabbaths, plural, and that's, that's festivals included, surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who sets you aside and makes you separate. You shall keep the Sabbath, that's singular, keep the Sabbath, therefore it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. Don't violate it. And that's him speaking to the people at Mount Sinai. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. And thank God we have Jesus who is forgiving us for our sins. Furthermore, work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe, and I want you to remember, keep and observe, okay? To observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed so it all goes back to what god did for creation and this, this is a sign that we have drawn ourselves and made a covenant with god it's a sign of us clinging to god and joining the children of israel 
that we also copy God because he rested on the seventh day. Here's more on the sign. This is Exodus 20, verse 1 through 13. And I gave them my statues and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths, plural, to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel, Israel, that's the 12 tribes and all the mixed multitudes, they're all together, including Egyptians and Jethroites and all them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statues. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defile, defiled my Sabbaths. So in the wilderness, they messed up. They didn't keep his Sabbaths and they, they disappointed God. Do you want to be on the end of disappointing God? This is to be a sign between him and his people. Let's talk about the Ten Commandments. So the Sabbath is in the Ten Commandments, and we're going to walk through the Ten Commandments. And I've actually had someone say, well, I don't keep all the commandments. I keep nine of them. Well, actually, there's actually more than just nine commandments. There's actually more than just ten commandments. There's, and if you take out the, the uh, temple processes and the temple commandments that are mostly just for the Levites who work in the temple, it's not 613, which is what the rabbis say. There's 613. They're using gematria, and they're doubling up some of the commandments to get up to that number. I've done a calculation of what's left after you've removed all those and you've quit doubling. And I got somewhere around 230. I don't have the exact number, but it's about 230 commandments that are actually applicable to us today. That's pretty good when you compare it to you know, government laws, and, you know, they, they're probably in the millions of laws that are applicable to us, you know, don't speed, don't uh, commit perjury, all these, all these government, you know, crazy laws that they, they've come up with. Which one's easier, a million laws or 230? Most of them are about, you know, lying and stealing, and stuff like that. So the Ten Commandments are a combination of of uh loving your god and loving your neighbor and they are a, a summed up version of all the other commandments all the the 230 commandments or 237 whatever the number is um that's left and still applies to you and jesus talks about that in john that you know the greatest are these two love the god love your god with all your heart and love your neighbor so the ten, there's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. So we're actually going to look at, is it, you know, what's, what's the point in going with nine or ten? Let's look at all of them. So Exodus 20 is where the Ten Commandments are given out. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. And uh, I would, let's put a check mark behind all of them that sound reasonable, right? How can you say that this is done away with? You shall have no other gods before me. That means in his face, in front of him. You don't want to do that. That is not good. In fact, they, they did that at Mount Sinai immediately. They started worshiping, you know, golden calf in front of him, before his face, in front of him. Number two, you shall not make for yourself carved images, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above like birds flying clouds and stuff sun star moons or that is in the earth beneath you know serpents and animals and stuff like that or that it is the waters under the earth being fish you know alligators stuff like that don't make any carved images to worship that are are animals and all this you know what he's saying you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. So don't create a statue and start bowing to it. For I, 
the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but sowing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And commandments is instructions. You know, the, the Hebrew word is Torah. And Torah means instructions. These are the instructions. You know, some people, they get caught up in the word law. And Western society, when you say the law, you get this, this image of some police officer that's going to drag you away in handcuffs. That's not what that word means biblically. But when you seek law, you should think instructions. And that's what God has given us these instructions on how to live our life uh, safely and wonderfully with these guidelines that keep us away from hurting others and hurting him. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord God, of, of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And we're putting, we put checks on those. I would say check, check. And now we come to the fourth commandment. And this is where people would say, ha, huh, we don't put a check on this. Well, let's look at it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. This is the one people have a problem with. They want to forget it, even though it says remember it. We can do all, all these other ones. We, we've, this is the one you don't want to check. So I say, what's wrong with it? Let's investigate. So that's the point of this, this teaching. We want to figure out, are we supposed to continue remembering it? Here's commandment number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath day, Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the Sabbath, the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So it all goes back to God did it, so you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to remember what God did. He created everything that you see. He created the universe, created the sun, moon, and the stars. He put them in their place, and he, cre and he created man, and he breathed life into us. And if he didn't do that, we, we wouldn't be here. And so God is saying, I did all of this, and I want you to remember that every single week. And sit down and rest just like me. Is God still resting on the Sabbath day? That's a good question. I don't see why he wouldn't be. So if God did it and he's telling us to do it. I think we should do it. Let's continue on. Number five. Commandment number five. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord God your Lord, uh, sorry, the Lord, your God is giving you. I put a check on that one. Number six is this one done away with. You shall not murder. Has that commandment been done away with? Should we go around murdering people? I don't think so. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. I think Jesus uh, also reinstated that one. Didn't he talk about, you know, committing adultery in someone's heart? Yes, he did. All right. Number eight, you shall not steal. Let's put a check on that one too. I like the fact that nobody takes my stuff. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. You shall not testify against your neighbor falsely. You know, that's a, man, I'm so glad. If we didn't have that one, our society would fall apart. Fall all apart. 
Number 10, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. That means don't be eyeing other people wanting to take their stuff because that will lead to you actually taking their stuff. And you covet other people's things, you're going to steal. You're going to commit adultery. You might even murder. This one leads to all the other ones. And so God is saying, hey, you focus on what you got and don't be eyeing other people's stuff wanting to take it. I think that's a good one. Has that one done away with? Should we go covet everybody's stuff? Take it away. No, I think we put a check on that. So is it nine or 10? We're going to go further and what happened to the Sabbath and why people might be out there saying, oh, nine, we keep nine of them. We're going to investigate that further and we're going to show you what happened. All right. Comparing Sabbath and commandments. So Exodus 20, verse eight, and this is what we just read. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That word remember in Hebrew in Exodus 20 is zakar, which we, which we translate as remember. More accurately, it means to recall, to think back to it, to have it active in your mind that you're doing this over and over to remember it, to, to recall it, to bring it back into your mind. That's what that word means. It's a car. And the Bible actually has two places where the Ten Commandments are, are given out. So God's given it to Moses, and then Moses gives it out to the people. And then that happens in Deuteronomy. So this is Moses giving it again. And of course, the people will have both of these. But the word you're going to see here is observe. Remember, I said observe and keep. So I told you to remember those two. Here in Deuteronomy 5.12, it says about the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments, it says observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. As the Lord your God commanded you, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of the Lord your God. And then it goes on to, uh, you know, the reason being is because God created everything. Creation goes back to God and creation. So when you take, and, and the Hebrew word for that is shamar. Shamar means to observe, to do it, to practice it. So when you put these two together, and you'll see it in other verses talking about this, you put them both together, you get the true understanding of what you're supposed to do with the Sabbath. You're supposed to remember it and observe it. You're supposed to remember it and do it, practice it. You have to have those together to understand that. So check those out. Go to those two places and see, see how they're translated. Why does some people say no buying or selling on the Sabbath day? Why is that a thing? Well, uh, some of it goes into rabbinical stuff, but let's look at the Bible and where people are getting it from. So buying and selling, and that comes from Nehemiah 13, verse 15 to 22. In those days, I saw people in Judah. This is Nehemiah talking, saying, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath. And there, there were winemakers in there. They're, making wine on the Sabbath, and bringing in sheaves, that's bringing in wheat and barley, and, lo and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also, who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah, that's in, in Jerusalem, and said to them, 
what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do this? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So he's saying, didn't God punish us before because we did because we violated his Sabbath? Now you're going to make God punish us again because you're violating what he says to do on the Sabbath. Furthermore, so it was at the gates of Jerusalem as it began to be dark before the Sabbath. So, so Nehemiah is saying, hey, even before the Sabbath, 30 minutes before the Sabbath, 20 minutes, whatever it was, it was just before the Sabbath. And he's making this commandment now. He says that I command that I command the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be open until after the Sabbath. Then I posted some of my servants at the gates so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath. Now the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside of Jerusalem once or twice. Then I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. Well, that's a big warning. So basically, these people are hanging out around the, the outside of the gates, waiting to sell things and hoping that maybe some people can sneak out and buy some stuff or they can sneak in and sell some stuff. And Nehemiah is saying, hey, this is your last warning. If you continue to do this, I'm going to lay hands on you. That means it's going to get rough. It's going to get, you're going to get in trouble. We're going to rough you up. You might get sent to the, the prison or you might get killed. He said, I'm going to put a stop to it. I will lay hands on you. you know, if I was, you know, in school and someone said, I'm going to lay hands on you. I know it's going to be a fight. Anyways, so from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. So Nehemiah, here's Nehemiah putting a stop to the buying and selling and causing people to work and come and sell. Even foreign people are coming in and selling stuff on the Sabbath. And he said, I'm going to put a stop to this and I'm going to put the Levites at the gates. I wonder what was in their hands at the gates. They might have had, you know, some swords or beer or something but anyways they're the worker bees of the temple is the levites so i have this buffet story um one of my friends a dear friend of mine he he told me a story about how he came to know god uh kind of late in life actually and he came to be reading his bibles and he worked as a manager of a buffet I won't say the company, uh, which which company it was, but he was the manager, and he had all these church crowds that would come in after church, and he was just fresh into you know reading and on fire with God, and he would talk to them every time he had an opportunity. They would come in, and he would say, "Hey, I just read this in the Bible. Do you, what do you know about this? Do you know anything about Samson? What What do you know about Daniel? Hey, I just read this in Revelations. What do you think that that means? And he, over the months, he had this great relationship with some of these these uh, Christians that come out of church to his buffet. And they said, "Oh man, you you're really on fire, you know, reading and and you should come to our church on Sunday." And he looked at him and he said, "No, I I can't come to your church." And they said, well, why can't you come to our church? He said, because I have to be at this restaurant every Sunday morning to prepare food for all of y'all when you come out of the church on Sunday. And that was such a profound moment. Is These people, they love God, but they're, they're causing this guy to not be able to go join them. And I thought, wow. 
that's such a bad, unfortunate situation. But God has already thought that out. If you are not causing others to work and you're not working, then everybody has the opportunity and the time to go to church or go to the synagogue or go gather in a park together. There's nobody um, stepping in the way to cause you to miss out on an opportunity. You know, he, he wants, he would love to go to church with them, but he can't. He's got to go four hours early and prepare all the buffets so that these people could come and spend their money. It was such a great story. I, I, it really stuck with me. That's the buffet story. Some might say that is just for the Jews. I've actually encountered these uh, people who have said that's just for the Jews. But we're going to look at that. Is that really just for the Jews? What's the Bible say? Exodus 12, verse 37 through 39. Then the children of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot beside, beside children. A mixed multitude went up with them, also flocks and herds, a great deal of livestock, and they baked unleavened cakes of, dough, of the dough which they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leaven, because they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait, nor they had they prepared provisions for themselves. So just point out here, it's the children of Israel. Children of Israel is a multitude of people. You got different tribes. The tribe of Judah is the Jews, or what we call the Jews today. So that's just one tribe. Who knows uh, which tribe you might belong to? I know some people theorize that Manassas and Ephraim are the British Empire, and the British and the Europeans that came to the United States is, is Ephraim. And that the Irish is the tribe of Dan and the Scottish are the tribe of Dan and Denmark might be the tribe of Dan. So these, these Israelites, they all dispersed around the world. And it's a mixed multitude. So it's the 12 tribes which you might be a part of. Who knows? God knows. And also the Egyptians and the Edomites and the Jethroites and the Midianites they, it was a multitude of people that had joined themselves with these people that see that God is with these people. This, this, this God that wiped out the, the Egyptian army with water. And again, this, this is actually when they're on their way to Mount Sinai. And I have these beautiful pictures of the real Mount Sinai. It's a burnt mountain that's in Saudi Arabia in the land of Midian, which the Bible says is in Midian. In Galatians, Paul says Mount Sinai is in Arabia. I don't care what Constantine's mommy Helen says. It is in Midian. It is south of Israel. They crossed the Gulf of Aqaba. I have a whole entire teaching on this, on the real Mount Sinai. You should go check it out. It's really great. I got a lot of detail. It'll blow your mind. We, we, we know where the mountain of God is, and the evidence is amazing, and people have yet to um, do archaeological digs on it and but people have gotten in and there's now documentaries that are about to be made on it so check out project truth beams the real mount sinai it's amazing numbers 11 verse 4 through 6 now the mixed multitude again mixed multitude it's a it's a it's not just the jews who were among them yielded to insist, I'm in, um, sorry, intense craving, so that the children of Israel also wept again and said, "Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the shallots, and here I, I should have changed the shallots, the onions and the garlic, but now our whole being is dried up." There is nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. So these are the Israelites complaining. They're thinking back to the time when we were in Egypt. They, they already left. They're wandering in the wilderness and they're complaining. Ah, oh, we, 
we miss the way it was in Egypt where we had all this food and, you know, we're getting tired of eating this, this plain old manna every day. And uh, again, the point of me pointing this out is it's a mixed multitude. It is not just Jewish people. God didn't make a covenant with just Jewish people. He made a covenant with a mixed multitude of people, including the 12 tribes. He calls them the children of Israel. And, and, and if it was the later in history, you have the, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, which is in the south. So the house of Israel was also included. That was the northern part of Israel. It was the 12, the 10 tribes lived up there. And they also kept the Sabbath. That is the main point. They also kept all the commandments. Now, they might have turned and gone wicked, and then they dispersed around the world. But all 12 tribes kept the Sabbath. That is important to remember. Let's look at the New Testament. There are 60 references to the Sabbath in the New Testament. I'm not going to read all 60. I'm just going to read a few of them. You can go do that for yourself. But there are a lot of references to the Sabbath in the Old Testament. I don't have the number in front of me, but there's 60 in the New Testament. That is important. People read the New Testament and they completely miss the fact that the Sabbath is being mentioned everywhere. And people are keeping the Sabbath everywhere. If it was done away with, why is it that they're continuing to do it even after Jesus leaves? Let's read some of them. So Mark 1, verse 21. Then they went to, into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. This is Jesus. He traveled, on the, and he got to where he was at. And he entered the Sabbath. Uh, he was on the Sabbath and he entered the synagogue and taught. Mark 2, verse 27. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the son of man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And we're going to get into this, the uh, Lord's Day and all that. But the important part here is that the Sabbath was before man, God rested on the Sabbath. And then we are to create it, not the other way around. The Sabbath is not for us, it's for God. Mark 6, verse 2. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things and what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands so these people are hearing jesus on the sabbath where he's teaching in the synagogues and he's saying amazing things they've never heard before and he's laying hands on them and praying and and healing these people He's doing this on the Sabbath. Now, isn't it, isn't it something that we strive to, to do is follow in Jesus' footsteps, do like he did? Well, if Jesus was on the Sabbath teaching, praying, and healing people, shouldn't we be doing that also on the Sabbath day? Isn't that important to mimic the Messiah, to mimic him if he is loving everybody around him and he's caring for the wick and the sick and the sick and visiting the sick shouldn't we also do those things why do we draw a line on the sabbath and say well jesus might have done it but we don't have to do that we don't have to copy him exactly to a t we don't have to copy all of what he did we can just take this one thing that doesn't make any sense that's not something we should be doing we should be copying Jesus to the fullest. We should be, you know, Paul says, follow me as I follow Jesus, as I follow Yeshua in Hebrew. We're supposed to be following him in his footsteps. What does it mean to follow in someone's footsteps? You step exactly like they did. You don't, you don't just walk sideways or turn around and walk the other way. You, you put your foot exactly where he put his foot. That's what we we're supposed to do. Luke 4. Verse 16 to 17. So he came to Nazareth, being Jesus, where 
he had brought been brought up and as his custom see this is traditional as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the sabbath day and stood up to read and he was handed the book of isaiah and of course he reads from the book of isaiah you know declaring that he basically is the messiah and this has been fulfilled in your ears and they chase him off because they they were they were stunned by what he said but the the main thing you should see there is it was customary and they're making the distinction that it's not in the old testament that you have to teach in a synagogue in fact there's nowhere it says that it only says that you got to go to the temple synagogues was a system that was created in Babylon. It was a, a way of keeping the communities together and, and a way to get uh, people educated on what God is requiring of them. The synagogue system is not biblical. It might be great and it might be beneficial, but it's not commanded. You could worship. The early church, they did their gatherings in people's homes. And I, I really like that. It's very personable. It makes for a good family. But anyways, so the point I'm trying to make here is it's, it's a tradition that people would gather together on the Sabbath. The, the requirement is to rest. You have to separate that out. Now, you might do it the same way, like the Jesus did it and all the people at that time. They got together on the Sabbath. That's fine. Just know that's not a requirement. It was a customary thing. If we are to follow in his footsteps, then we should go and teach on the Sabbath day, right? Just a thought. In the New Testament, more teachings on the Sabbath. This is more stuff about teaching on the Sabbath. This is Luke 4, verse 32, 31, 32. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, which is right near the water, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished by at his teachings, for his words was with authority. This is they were amazed. Here's Jesus teaching on the Sabbaths, plural. That means he was teaching many Sabbaths. He stayed with them for quite a while. Does it say he taught every single day? He might have taught every day, but that's not what it's saying. It's saying he was teaching them on the Sabbaths. Luke 6, verse 5 through 6. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. Now it happened on another Sabbath that he entered the synagogue and taught. So he is Lord of the Sabbath. We're going to get into that later. What day is the Lord's day? If he's the Lord of the Sabbath, we're going to get into that. Let's talk about healing. Healing on the Sabbath. There's no, there's no uh, commandment where you're forbidden from healing on the Sabbath. There's no commandment to say you're forbidden to pray, to consult God, to ask God to work for miracles. None of that. That is, that is rabbi stuff. That is uh, oral Torah, man-made doctrine that you can't heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus was being got confronted by the Pharisees on this and, and eating and all that stuff. So let's look at this verse in Luke 14, 1 through 4. Now it happened as he went into the house of the one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. And behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy which is edemia and jesus answering spoke to the lawyers and the fair and the pharisees saying is it lawful to heal on the sabbath but they kept silent and he took him and he healed him and let him go and so he was right there in front of the pharisees and he turned to them because it's it's their rules and their man-made doctrine that they can't do healing because it's considered work on the sabbath and jesus is asking them straight up in their face is it lawful to heal on the sabbath and they 
said nothing because they knew what he was asking. Is it in the Torah? Is it in the, the Old Testament? Is it in the written down scriptures that I can't do this? I'm going to do it in front of you. Right in their face. Beautiful. John 9, verse 14. Now, it was a Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again, how did he, uh, he had received his sight? This was a blind man who had never seen ever in his whole entire life. Everybody knew he was blind since birth. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and washed, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he, has, he does not keep the Sabbath. Well, that's their own man-made doctrine that you can't heal on the Sabbath. That's not what the Sabbath says. The Sabbath is rest. God is, you know, you rest from your, your work. You rest from your job. You're, you're, if you're a winemaker, you stop making wine on that day. If you're a bricklayer, you don't lay brick on that day. It's about rest. And uh, they're saying, well, he violated our rules, our, our religious rules. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So there was people there that said, how can this guy not be of God? He does such great, wonderful things for people. This is of love, you know. This is not of someone who is wicked and is violating God's law. It's because it was man's doctrines that he was embarrassing them in front of them. You know, these Pharisees wore nice, fancy clothes with all the sparkles, and they didn't let people touch them, and they said long prayers, hours long in public. You know, it was all for show. It was all for naught. Let's look at the women who followed Jesus. These are the women that were with the disciples. Luke 23, verse 55. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb. This is talking about the women who came to his tomb after he was already sacrificed. This is after Jesus had died for our sins and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and uh, fra fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So here is some people who were right there, ground zero with the disciples. They saw Jesus die. If Jesus had told and taught them while he was alive that the Sabbath was going to be done away with, they would not have rested and kept the Sabbath right after he died. That's not something he taught. If he was going to tell us, well, the Sabbath is going to be done away with, wouldn't Jesus would have made it clear to everyone? And wouldn't his followers also practice that and, and act that after he has died? The answer is yes, they would have, if that was the case, which it is not. And we have a lot more evidence to go through. Let's look at Paul. Paul did not meet uh, Christ when he was alive before crucifixion. Paul got to meet Christ in his glorified state, in his resurrected state. And Paul, we're going to look at his verses and what he's doing in regards to the Sabbath. Acts 13, verse 13. Now, when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch at Sida and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. This is Paul continuing to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. Why? Because he's keeping the Sabbath. He's not working. He's not doing a job. He's going in uh, on the Sabbath. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent 
to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any words of extortion for the people, say on. So Paul comes there. It's the Sabbath. He's joining them. They're all resting on the Sabbath, and listening to people read the Torah scrolls and read the prophets, the law, because Paul is also keeping the law. He's wanting to hear it and read it. And uh, they turn to him and say, hey, would you like to teach us? And then he goes on to talk, tell them about Christ. In Acts 13, verse 26, this is a continuation. Men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you, this is Paul talking, who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent for those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. So what he is saying is all you people, you sit here and you hear the prophets, you, you hear it every Sabbath. Well, Jesus is that one they talked about. Jesus, you didn't know it, but I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And he's doing this on the Sabbath. He's also teaching on the Sabbath. You people still read the law and the prophets. Do you still read it? It was okay with Jesus and Paul that people were reading those prophets and the law in the synagogues on the Sabbath. Should we continue to do that? Should we continue to follow in the footsteps of Paul and going into the uh, places of worship, you know, synagogues, churches, etc., on the Sabbath and reading and teaching from the law and the prophets? That would be recreating something that people have done for hundreds and thousands and thousands of years. It's beautiful. I think we should be doing it. I think everybody should be doing it. New Testament. Continuation. What should be taught to incomers? So people that are former pagans or, or and, and now, and it, this didn't happen in the ancient days, but it does today. People who did not believe in God. They didn't believe that there was a God. Atheists, agnostics, whatever. That's a new thing. That's not something that the ancient people actually had is there's no word for it back then everybody believed in gods or god so this is what the bible says what should be taught to incomers in acts 15 verse 19 therefore i judge that you should not trouble those from among the gentiles who are turning to god but they but that we write them to abstain from things polluted by idols from sexual immorality from things strangled and from blood let me let me explain what that is that is the entire process of being a pagan who worships at the pagan temples the the polluted idols that that is the statues in the temple the sexual immorality is the temple prostitutes that people would pay at the pagan temples to be a worship ritual in front of their, you know, fake God, the sun God, Zeus or whatever. And the strangled things would be the animals that they would strangle as a sacrifice. They didn't, the pagans didn't slice the necks and drain the blood. That was what the Hebrews did. What they did is they the Greeks strangled their animals, their pigs, their, their sheep, their goats, their whatever. They strangled them. And because they strangled them, then they had all this blood. Everything was bloody. The animals kept their blood in them. They cooked them with the blood. And so that is what this verse is talking about. The things that you should tell the incomers is don't do the pagan temple rituals. Turn away from that worship of pagan of foreign god don't go to those temples and don't do those rituals anymore and this is the continuation so don't do those things and it says for it's most important for moses has had throughout many generations 
those who preach him every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So, to the newcomers, turn away from pagan idolatry and go to the synagogues, go to the churches on the Sabbath because you're going to learn Moses. You're going to learn about the law. You're going to learn about the Ten Commandments. You're going to learn about how to live your life. And that is all in the Bible. You're going to hear that on the Sabbath when you go there. So, so those people are going to catch up is what he's saying. Just tell them these, the basics. You know, they'll get there because they're learning Moses. They're not going to get there overnight. But just tell them, you know, stay away from the pagan, you know, abominations. And they'll, they'll catch up. They'll learn. It's being taught. They'll hear the law being read. And it'll be fine. So, and Paul's making it very easy for people to come in. Gentiles. What else did Paul do on the Sabbath? Acts 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath day, we went out to the city, to the riverside, where prayer was customary made. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. Now, a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, Thyatira, sorry, who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoke by Paul. So this is, this is something that Paul did on the Sabbath day. He went to the riverside where everybody collected. And he sat down and spoke to people and told them, about Yeshua, told them about Jesus, told them about God, and, and opened people's eyes. That's another thing that we should be doing on the Sabbath. We should be going to malls and going to places, parks and stuff, and just casually talking about God to people and, uh, and converting people and telling people, you know, this is a better way of life. God loves you. He wants, he wants, he wants you to rest. Today is the day of rest. You know, how are these people going about their lives and they never they never hear about this stuff you you know paul was doing it should we be doing it paul was going into places and reading from the torah and telling people about jesus and he's also going out to the riverside to the to the nice looking uh sweet place where people go and relax by the water and he's teaching them on the sabbath day is that a great thing that we should mimic i think it is i think that we should be doing that Maybe we'll convert a lot more people if we gave people time uh, like this to sit down and talk. Paul continues to teach on the Sabbath everywhere he goes. Let's look at Acts 17, verse 2. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and three, for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining the demonstration demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and raise again rise again sorry from the dead and saying this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ and some of them were persuaded and a great multitude devout, devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women Join Paul and Silas. So for three Sabbaths in a row, is, is Paul still keeping Sabbaths? This is, this is in Acts. Yes, he's everywhere he's going, he's doing things on the Sabbath. This is his, his new custom thing that he's doing is he's three Sabbaths in a row, he's staying at a place and he's teaching. And people are converting. Beautiful. It says God was blessing him uh, teaching on the Sabbath. Acts 18, verse 3. So because he, that being Paul, was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. And that's not tent makers like how you're picturing. This is uh, something that, would, that you could do short term. You know, Paul was making prayer shawls to be a giant tent maker. It takes a team of people and it takes over a year. 
Paul wasn't doing that. Paul was traveling. So Paul was making prayer shawls. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jew and Greek. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Mashiach. He is the Messiah. Let's look at Galatians. Colossians, sorry. Chapter 2, verse 15. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are shadow things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Let no one, let me stop right there. So this is actually a verse that people will use to say, hey, you can't point out that I want to worship on a different day. That is by no means what this verse is talking about. This is talking about the fact that people are keeping the Sabbath. They're keeping the festivals. They are keeping the new moons, which means it's, it's a, a monthly cycle. It's a calendar thing. And that people are judging them when they go into the Greeks land and when they go to Turkey and when they go to Italy and when they go to Greece and when they go to um, Iraq, that people are judging them because they are keeping these things. They are eating clean foods and they are drinking uh, clean drinks and they are re uh, keeping the festivals and the new moons and the Sabbaths. They're doing all these things. And by the which, by which it's also saying that this is shadow pictures. These are shadow things to come. These are future fulfillments. All of these things are future fulfillments. These are prophecies. And here it's saying, don't let those people judge you. Don't let those people um, discourage you and pick on you because you keep the Sabbaths. That's what this verse is saying. And here, let's pick up some more. So let no one cheat you of your reward. These are reward things. Taking delight in false humilities and Worship of angels. You're not supposed to do that. Paul's, Paul's saying, don't worship angels. And In, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. I've met people that are puffed up from their fleshly mind. There's, their intellect has taken them away. And not holding fast to the head from whom all the body, let's talk about the body of Christ, nourished and knitting together by joints and ligaments grow with increase from, that is, uh, I'm sorry, growing with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic prin principles of the world, that means the world has corrupted you. Why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations? This is man-made regulations. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concerns things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Saying, why do you bother yourself with these doctrines of men? these man-made regulations, you know, don't be concerned of what other people tell you. Don't be concerned that these people that you've now joined yourself with, say it's a church, are all telling you to do this one, you act this way, do this one thing, celebrate this way. Is it doctrines of men? Have you looked into the Bible to see if these people are lined up with scripture? If they're not lined up with scripture, you should start asking questions. Continuing, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion. So they appear to be religious. They appear to be great. They're false humility and neglect of the body. 
but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. They don't, they don't help you. They hurt you. It's fleshly. It feels good to do things the way everybody else does them. But I don't care what everybody else does. I only care what God wants me to do. I only care what the scriptures say to do. That's where you need to be. And that's what this, this particular section in Colossians is talking about. Don't let anybody in the world judge you because you want to do it the way God does it. You continue on your way. God is not interested in these doctrines of men that have been 